I'll be speaking to you today using language, because I can. It's one of these magical things that we humans can do, right? We can uh, use language, use sound, use writing to implant ideas in each other's minds, to transfer knowledge. And in fact, so much of what we know about the world is stuff that we are taught through language. Now, of course, there isn't just one language that's spoken around the world. There are about 7,000 languages spoken currently. There used to be many more in the past. And each language differs from the next in all kinds of ways. That raises the question of, if you speak a different language, do you think differently? Do you see the world differently? Do you experience the world differently? And there's an infinite set of things for us to potentially pay attention to. Languages select only some things for us to pay attention to, and different languages select really different ones. But what I want to do today is walk you through some of my favorite examples of how language guides us to think differently in particular ways, even starting with the very basics. So I'll start with how we think about time. So the word time is the most frequent noun in English. Other temporal words are also in the top 10. And this is very common across Indo-European languages. We're obsessed with how we talk about time. But how people think about time really differs across languages and cultures. You can all read this graphic very, very easily. This is a nutritional supplement for kids sold by Nestle. And you can look at this graphic and read it from left to right, and you can see what it's trying to suggest it would, this product would do for your child, right? When they started marketing this in Arabic-speaking countries, they ran into a problem because Arabic is written from right to left. <laughs> and so if you read this graphic from right to left, it's actually quite puzzling what this product is supposed to do for your child. So this is just a really basic thing about language, the way it's written, just the mere direction that it's written actually it turns out organizes all kinds of visual activity that we have, right? The way we scan images, the way we imagine things unfolding in our minds uh, will go systematically in the direction that we're used to reading and writing. So that's one way the time can go left to right or right to left. And here's another example. We used to think that the future had to be ahead. In English, we talk about the best things ahead of us, the past behind us, the worst things behind us, or putting things behind us, things like that. Looking forward to a brighter tomorrow. And people always had some reason, some necessary biological reason for why the future would have to be ahead. So we'd say things like, well, of course, we have eyes on the front of our heads, not on the backs of our heads. We walk forwards, not backwards. It makes perfect sense. It's biologically necessary that the future should be in front. Well, it turns out there are places where people put the past in front and the future behind. So here's an example from the Ayamara. These are folks that live in Bolivia. And this man here is talking about the olden days, and he's gesturing in front of him, because for them, the past in front, the way they move their bodies when they talk about the past, uh, references that it's in front. Well, why would the past be in front and the future behind? Well, for the Ayamara, it makes perfect sense. Of course, the past is known. It's manifest. That's why you can see it. Whereas the future is unknown. That's why it's behind your head, right? Once it becomes the present, becomes manifest, you can see it, then, then it comes in front of your eyes. Right? So for the Ayamaro, there's also a very necessary way that time had to be organized. It just happened to be exactly the opposite way that we thought. Here's another way that time can flow. So, so far I've told you about time going left to right, right to left, front to back, back to front. But those are all with relation to the body. Here's an example from an Aboriginal community in Australia that I had a chance to work with. These are the Kuktaira people. They live on the west coast of Cape York. And in languages uh, like Kuktaira, and there are a lot of languages like this around the world, you don't use words like left and right. And instead, everything is laid out in uh, some kind of cardinal or absolute directions. So in Kuktaira, it's roughly north, south, east, and west. So the way that you say hello in Kuktaira, instead of uh, us saying, how are you, fine, they say, which way are you heading? And the answer should be something like, north, northwest, in the far distance, how about you? Okay. So imagine as you're walking around, everyone you greet, everyone you say hi to during the day, you have to report your heading direction. Of course, if you had to start doing this now, it would be very hard, right? But if you actually had to do that, if that was the price of admission to a conversation, if you literally couldn't get past hello without knowing which way you were facing, you would very quickly get oriented. People who speak languages like this stay oriented extremely well. They actually stay oriented much better than we used to think humans could. 
Now, if folks in cultures like this uh, organize space in cardinal directions, how do they think about time? These here are pictures of my grandfather at different ages. I take these pictures, I put them in a stack, I scramble them, I hand them to you, and I say, lay these out in the correct order. Right? Well, the way I've put them out here is the way an English speaker would do it normally, from left to right. If you're a Hebrew or Arabic speaker, you might do it from right to left. What would the cook tire do if they don't use left and right? Well, here I'm going to show you a little bit of data. This is one person. They're sitting facing uh, south on this day. And uh, what I've shown you is a bunch of different card sets that they've organized. And the numbers show the order. So they've organized each of these card sets going from left to right. Here's the same person uh, on a different day. And not <coughs> now they're facing north. And you see they've organized all the card sets going from right to left. Here's a different person. This person is sitting facing east and they've organized all the card sets coming towards them. What's the pattern? I'm hearing east to west, right? The direction of the sun. Time is always going in the same direction for the cook tire, always from east to west, always laid out in the same direction on the landscape. Turns out time doesn't actually even have to go in a straight line. So there are some communities where time will uh, travel in a bent line. Here, for example, are the Yupno of Papua New Guinea. For them, time rolls into the village at one angle, and then after it hits the village, it takes a turn and rolls out at a different angle. And this has to do with the location of the mouth and the source of the Yupno River. These are important locations for the Yupno, so the topography of the place where they live dictates how they organize time. And I just want to give you all of these examples to show you how rich the set of possibilities is beyond the norms that we're used to, right? We have these kind of very standard ways that we're used to thinking about it. We, sometimes argue that those are necessary, that it has to be from left to right, or it has to be the future in front and the past behind. But in fact, the human mind is so much more creative and so much more flexible, and their set of possibilities is so much more rich in humans around the world, even for this very basic, simple thing of how to organize time, have come up with all of these different kinds of solutions. Here's another really smart human trick that may seem very simple to you. Suppose I ask you, how many penguins are there here? Eight. Very good. Excellent. You passed the test. Those of you who participated, you might have done something like this. You might have gone one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You recited the number list that you learned as a child in order. You named each element in the array. And once you had named each element in the array, the last word you said is the number of things in the, in the array. It's a really simple trick that we have learned as humans. And it's a cultural tool. It took a really long time for humans to invent this tool. We now, of course, take it completely for granted. But there are lots of languages that don't have this trick. In fact, they don't have number words at all. There are some languages that don't use base 10 number systems like we do. Instead, they use lots of other bases. For example, here's a, a language spoken in Papua New Guinea that's instead of being base 10, is base 27. It still uses the body. Base 10, of course, is the number of fingers we have. Other languages have base 5 or base 20. If, you know, if you don't wear shoes, you can wiggle your toes. In this language, it's base 27. So you start with the fingers on the one hand, and you just include more parts of the body instead of just the fingers. And the words for the body parts are actually the words for the numbers. So for example, if you want eight potatoes, that's elbow potatoes. So there's an incredible variety of systems that languages have invented, including not really having exact number words at all. Here's an example from a community that lives in Brazil. These are the Piraha. And there are no exact number words in the Piraha language. And here's a really simple test that the researchers have constructed. The researcher put out a certain number of spools of thread and have asked uh, the participant to lay out the same in balloons. And what the Piraha can do is if it's two or three, they can do a good job of matching, something you can do visually pretty easily. But once it gets above two or three or four, it gets harder. And because they're not able to do the simple enumeration, the simple trick that you did to count the penguins, they start making errors. And the larger the set they need to match, the larger the, the, larger the errors that they make. All right. And that's the kind of pattern that you get if you're testing people who don't have access to exact number words. 
if you find folks like this and you teach exact number of words and the pattern changes and they start being able to match exactly and the errors don't increase in the same proportion. Here's a, a really simple example where just having number of words in your language, of course, is not the same as understanding all of math, but it's that first entry point. It's a stepping stone into a whole world of knowledge. Think about how much of human civilization, modern human civilization, is made on math. Right? And here's the simple feature of a language that uh, acts as an entryway into the whole world of knowledge. Languages also divide the world into absurd categories, right? So uh, a lot of languages have grammatical gender. French, of course, has grammatical gender. Spanish and German, every noun is going to be masculine, feminine, German also neuter. Which genders get assigned to which nouns uh, has no rhyme or reason. There's almost no correlation across languages. They can vary a great deal. So for example, the sun is feminine German, masculine in Spanish. The moon is exactly the reverse. Does this matter for how speakers of French and German and Russian and Spanish think about the sun and the moon and everything else that can be named by a noun? Do people actually take these genders as meaningful? It turns out that they do. And it starts very early. So if you take young kids who are learning, say, French or Spanish as their first language, and you say, hey, you know what? We're making an animated movie, and we just need your help uh, assigning voices to these characters. So here we have an alarm clock that's going to be a character, and we have a, uh, this toaster that's going to be a character. What voices should they have? And even very young kids start assigning voices that are appropriate to the grammatical gender in their language, right? So they'll say, oh, it should have a boy voice if it's grammatically masculine. It should have a girl voice if it's grammatically feminine. If you ask adults to describe objects, say, give us three adjectives that describe a bridge, the first three that come to mind, people will give you adjectives that have these stereotypical gender connotations. So if the bridge is masculine in your language, you might say bridges are long and strong and towering. Right? And if bridges are feminine in your language, you might say that they're beautiful and elegant. You know, we're not asking people, uh, if you were to go on a date with a bridge, what kind of bridge would it be? We're just asking, you know, describe a bridge. And yet they're giving us these stereotypically gendered adjectives as, as their prompts, suggesting that this is something that's alive in their mind. And this is actually an effect, this effect of grammatical gender is something you can see with your own eyes if you go to an art gallery and you ask, when an artist is personifying, you know, painting time or painting death or painting charity, how do they decide what kind of body time or death or charity should have? How do they decide on that personification? Well, when you do an analysis of this, at least in European art, 78% of the time, you can predict the gender of the personification from the grammatical gender in the artist's native language. You can actually see grammar carved in stone. So here's Michelangelo's dawn and day and dusk and night. And all of these are predicted by uh, grammatical gender in Italian. The other thing language does for us is it allows us to construe events. So um, things happen. They need to be understood by us. We need to think about them in some way. Uh, and language gives us lots of different tools for understanding those events. And languages differ in how they're likely to describe an event. So in a case like this, in English, you might say, he broke the vase, even though it's clearly an accident. If he just took a mallet and uh, smashed the vase very intentionally, you would still say he broke the vase. Right? English is kind of weird in that, in that you can describe accidents using the same the same constructions that you would for an intentional action. So in English, you can even say things like, I broke my arm. Well, in a lot of languages, you can't use that construction unless you're a lunatic looking to break your arm and you succeeded, right? Uh, you would have to say something else. You'd have to say something like, oh, my arm got broken, or it so happened to me that my arm broke. You'd have to express it in some way that marked that it wasn't intentional. English is a little strange in that it doesn't strongly distinguish between intentional and accidental actions. Languages like Spanish do more strongly, so you're much more likely to say the vase broke or the vase broke itself if it's an accident. But also, if you're not saying he broke the vase when it's an accident, you say the vase broke or the vase broke itself, you're not necessarily talking about who did it. You're focusing on something else. And so this raises an interesting set of questions if speakers of English and Spanish and other languages look at a set of events, witness the same events, 
are they paying attention to the same things? Are they going to remember the same things? So if they're witnesses to some kind of incident, will they actually have the same memories of the event, even if they witness the same thing? Sometimes it's surprising for people to think that your memory could be not veridical. A lot of us like to think that we remember things perfectly, we're so great, right? Our memories are so great. But it's totally not true. Our memories are terrible. We have this illusion that we remember things that happen to us, but actually our brains are extremely selective at what kind of information they hold on to. And it turns out that one of the ways that we select what information to hold on to are the things that we're likely to have to talk about, the things that are likely to make it into how you would have described it. So language, the patterns in our language guide our attention, tell us what you should pay attention to, how you should think about an event. So here's a little example of a study we do. We show people videos. This guy, for example, is going to pierce the balloon. So very intentionally, he pierces the balloon and the balloon pops. And there's also an accidental version where he's just sitting there, minding his own business, he happens to move his uh, hand, and the balloon pops, and he's very surprised, right? So it's, it's, it's a, clearly an accident. And there are lots of other, other events that we show them. And then later, it's just a surprise eyewitness memory test, right? So earlier, you will have seen one of these guys perform some crime against a balloon, right? <laughs> uh, which one was it? Now, if you ask which one was it, if it was an intentional action, English speakers, Spanish speakers, remember who did it, right, if it's intentional. When it's an accident, the picture is different. English speakers still remember who did it, right? They would have said he popped the balloon if it was an accident, and they remember who popped the balloon. Spanish speakers are less likely to remember who did it if it's an accident. But if you ask, do you remember if it was an accident, the picture changes. Now it's the English speakers who don't remember whether or not it was an accident, and the Spanish speakers remember better. So you have speakers of two different languages looking at exactly the same event. They're eyewitnesses to the same event, and they come away with memories of different things. Languages and cultures make us extremely smart. We inherit so much of intellectual labor from people that came before us, right? Thousands and thousands of years of joint work by people who have developed our languages, developed ideas, built them into those languages that we now take completely for granted. Languages and cultures also reduce cognitive entropy. And what I mean is this. About any topic, there's a huge variety of ways that our human mind can think about them. But once we're entrenched in a particular language, in a particular culture, we tend to think about it in that one way. We kind of follow the grooves that language sets for us just knowing that there are all these other possibilities, just knowing that there's so much linguistic diversity, I think is a, a, a wonderfully freeing thought, right? The fact that there's so much linguistic diversity is a testament to the incredible ingenuity and flexibility of the human mind. Human minds have created not just one reality, but 7,000 and many more. And also languages are living things. We're constantly changing them. We're constantly moving them around uh, to suit our needs, right? That gives you a way of thinking about what is the language that you would want to create? What is the set of thoughts that you would want to have? How would you want others to think? Right? How, do you, how do you actually want to craft this dance between language and thought? Thank you guys very much. I really look forward to your questions.